I am Sergei Castaneda. I'm a practicing radiation oncologist. I completed residency about three years ago. And just to give you a minute of my background, I am uh, born and raised in Colombia, South America. That's when I did med school. And because of my interest in research, I decided to basically migrate to the United States in my last year of medical school. And I was able to do it by doing basic research and I moved to Boston to do so. After completing my medical school, I was fortunate to continue doing postdocs in a couple of different institutions in Boston. And that allowed me to get very passionate about knowing and wanting to know more about radiation biology, which obviously led me to my interest in clinical radiation oncology, and that's how I pursue my training. So I'd like to keep going today with our outline. I'd like to, the introduction was the part of basically my, my experience. What I would like to add to that part is I've been practicing in the outreach community setting for a couple of large academic institutions within the United States. That's where I did my radiation oncology training at Drexel University, Hahnemann University Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I got to stay in Philadelphia working for Thomas Jefferson University and being able to work in the community. So I was, I believe, pretty lucky that I was able to be a general practitioner after completing my residency, but still having the possibility of discussing cases and reviewing contours and reviewing plans with site specific experts within a large radiation oncology department. I followed that by also joining a couple of different clinics at UPMC, that's University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, with a similar format. And this case was more definitely living and, and practicing within the community. So I can relate to that if that's your setting right now or hope to be your setting once you are out of residency. I've been doing that for the last three years. And more recently this year, I transitioned to be more site specific. So my interest and expertise now is developing into CNS, central nervous system cancers, pediatric cancers, and thoracic malignancies, but very, very special interest in CNS and pediatrics. But being that said, I have, I've had the, the possibility of, of treating many, many, many patients with more of the general emphasis that, com that convey and its specific importance for today's lecture. That includes prostate cancer, cervical cancer, and GI, lower GI malignancies, including rectum and anal cancer. And I think those are the main topics that we'd like to cover today. To jump into, since we finished my introductions, I'd like to continue with the previous questions. So, this was a very useful exercise for us to get a sense of the level of knowledge, which was great for many of you participants, but also more importantly, to be able to emphasize the points that we like to make through our lectures. So today I am going to basically repeat a couple of those questions. I don't think the Zoom poll function is exactly for this particular session, but, but I think we should probably go ahead and review this question with you because that's going to we're going to spend a fair amount of time at the beginning of of the contouring experience to to do it so i believe the the poll is just pulling up properly so this okay. is uh, yeah perfect what is the correct way to contour elective lymph nodes for pelvic malignancies so we have four options a b c and d and i see people already answering here and probably we'll give it maybe another 10, 10 seconds or so for people to make their selections. Okay, I think we have a pretty good sample and it's, yeah, we're up to, we basically just reached about half of you guys. So I think this is representative. So I'll stop here. And I'll give you the options that were selected. So for option A, that was selected by 8% of you. Option B was selected by 
option C was selected by 13%, and option D, which is the correct, was selected by 77% of you. So I'm glad that this is well understood by basically three quarters of you. And to emphasize the points that I'm gonna try to make as I do my own contours and kind of tell you what is my workflow and, and what I do pay attention while contouring, I'll make the point that we're doing uh, probably 0.7 millimeters, I'm sorry, 0.7 centimeters, let's call those seven millimeter expansions around the vessels that we want to cover, both the veins and the arteries. And we see that area they cover about the seven millimeters that needs to be included about seven millimeters there. And in here, we're not going seven millimeters appropriately because that's the edge of bowel and that should not be including that volume because it's not a risk for microscopic extent. Appropriately here has been adjusted and not to include bone, not to include muscles, but to include the pre space. And here we are excluding again muscle, but including the vessels, uh, the external iliac, internal iliac, external iliac, both veins and arteries here, and the internal iliac and veins in this area. All right, very good. The next question, is what is the correct way to contour the high-risk lymph nodes in rectal and anal cancers? So now looking at lower GI malignancies, understanding if this case was a rectal cancer, a stage, clinical stage T3, what would be, and the pink contour being the GTB and green the bladder, what are the appropriate contours? So I'm just selecting C, just because it's next to my mouse, but we have four options and I'd like you guys to go ahead and, and make selections. When we reach about 50% sample, I think at that point we can possibly just stop and, and go over the, the learning points for this particular type of contour. As you see, what well, is definitely more generous than the previous because it's a rectal cancer. Okay, we're 65% we're of people, so I'm going to end the poll there. So we have for option A, 13% of participants, option B, 20%, option C, 44%, and option D, 23%. This is, for this particular case, option B is the correct. And I like to highlight what makes this the correct option. So option B, I'd, I'd like to remind you guys, it was selected by 20% of you. So I'll try to, again, pay more attention as I walk you guys through my own way of doing lower GI elective lymph node volumes. And this is gonna be covered definitely in the rectal cancer section, but to emphasize that not including at least one, maybe one and a half up to two centimeters of the bladder is incorrect. So that makes options C and D incorrect because it's cropping out the bladder, which by, it needs to be included in this volume, but that's not the, necessarily the pelvic lymph node part of the lecture. But for today, very importantly, I'd like you to pay attention to this area. So as the sacral nerve roots exit, we need to include that because that is a common area of recurrence for rectal cancer. And that needs to be very well delineated and contoured for rectal cases, which was not done in option D or option A. So that makes these two options incorrect. And this is tricky in a sense, because when we do cervical cancer volumes, we don't have to be, and, and often we don't, or even prostate cancer, more importantly. In prostate cancer, we often will use volumes more similar to this presacral, including this part of the presacral space without including the sacral and nerve roots. All right, so enough said about this. This is helpful to me. I still basically only one fifth of you understand those concepts that I'm going to be explaining today, and I'm happy to cover it. So for General review, this is to point the different sources that we wanted to share with you. It's not an exhaustive 
by all means, list of resources. But I do agree with, with the previous speakers in session one that we have many resources. And I think getting familiar with them and use them appropriately is going to be to our advantage as, as we grow in as clinicians and we deliver care to our patients. So i like to, to mention that contouring is definitely, we need to combine clinical expertise, which is what we have learned as oncologists and as physicians, but we need to combine that with technical skills that has to do with using the treatment planning system and and what we're trying to cover or we are covering in our curriculum, which is evidence-based uh, contouring depending on specific uh, sites of cancer. We would like you, this is an idea that I think we should consider. And if we make this happen for some of you, hopefully many of you, then I think we achieve success, at least in this particular lecture, is to consider implementing or improving, if you have it, a peer review of contours prior to radiation planning. I'll explain the workflow. Right now, I work at Miami Cancer Institute that's located in Miami, and we have site-specific radiation oncologists, and we are we review every single patient for every single indication, regardless whether it's palliative or it's a definitive case, every day. And we do it twice per day, and we do it in a very efficient manner, and that will allow us to review prospectively every single contour that is done for every single patient. And that sounds time intensive, and it is, and it was not what I, would, I practice in other institutions, but I do see the advantage. So I like to, to invite you to consider doing it more often, if not done, or, or if it's done, and if it's not done, in trying to implement it. And what allows is for the planners, the physicists in many of your centers, or if you have dosimetrists, to have contours that have been peer reviewed, meaning not only the physician that's treating that specific patient, and but allows the input from a cancer site specific radiation oncologist to improve the quality of those contours. And we do believe that improves the quality and improves the outcomes for those patients. I do know that resources are limited in many, in many, many places. And I have practice in, in those settings, so I can see how this is not practical for every single one of you, but the ones that might have that option, at least having more than one radiation oncologist in the cancer center where you guys work, it will be ideal to review those contours in a basically prospective manner before we even do any planning. And I do know that plans are reviewing in, in, in most institutions, at least that's an, an another useful and a very safe way of delivering radiation oncology to our patients. The other point that I wanted to make, and I'm going to try to make throughout the, the lecture today or today, this session that we share our experiences, that evidence-based contouring does improve patient outcomes. So thank you for attending this course and, and spending the time to, to continue honing those skills and, 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 and getting, getting and improving with, with some of the content that we are providing. And this is just an introductory session, meaning the specific experts are going to give you more details than I will give you today. And, and it's going to matter a lot for, for adequate and, and safe plans for, for patients being treated for GI versus gynecological versus GU malignancies in the pelvis. This was one of the resources that we shared. I think it's a fantastic review, anatomical review of the different lymph node levels and how are in correlation with other organs in the pelvis. So I encourage you to review that on your own if you haven't done it. This pelvic anatomic, pelvic anatomy for contouring is also more or less slide, PowerPoint slide based. So it's probably easier to, to, to get to follow and, and see CT correlates of anatomical lymph node regions. We did also share this is the one of the latest energy oncology updates related to uh, a consensus from experts for lymph nodes in intact and postoperative process cases. And I think it brings some important points. I might make use of their paper to, to, to mention that to you today. Oh, e uh, Dr. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. So one of the participants mentioned they prefer using a pointer slash cursor over annotation. So, okay. um, so are you able to see yeah. my cursor? 
Not able to see it at the moment. Oh, that's not good. What about this one? Laser point. Now you can see oh, it. Okay. Yep. Can see it now. Oh, Thank you. Very good. We can use that or we can use the annotation. I, I think the laser point is what they prefer, which I'm okay to, to use. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I've been using my course, I guess it was not being seen, which is a good time to know it. All right. So this is the eContr website. It saved me many times where I got to treat, or I would say I got to do contours as a resident, as a junior resident, and I never done a specific case. And even books can help you. They don't give you all the details and you cannot really scroll up and down through books, but you can do that in eContr. So this came along basically at the beginning of my residency training, and it has been a very useful source since then. And some of the residents at the same time I was training, they did contribute to some of the arrow cases. Arrow is the American Radiation Oncology, Arrow is <laughs> Association for Residents in Radiation Oncology, which is one of the branches from ASTRO. And, and some of my co residents contributed to create cases through Arrow. And, and, and because of collaboration, those cases have been included in, in the format of eContour, which is very interactive and I highly recommend it. Not all experts agree that every single case is the way that they will do it. In some areas, for just to mention something, in head and neck, some institu institutions use tighter margins in how they develop their volume. So there can be some variation between institutions, but it's a good starting point to understand what an expert would do if they had a case similar to the one that has been posted. Another very useful source. I hope you're getting familiar because I, I think it's fantastic that we have the, the educational grant from Bruno DS to use this for our teaching endeavors. This allows us to share with you cases in which you can also be interactive and you can modify this. Unlike eContour that are just for anyone to be reviewing them, these ones you actually can modify them and, and we can collaborate in, in that space. All right, so let's talk about now about how can we use Eclipse. And I'm going to use Eclipse because more than 90% of you told us that that's the treatment planning system implemented at the current locations where you are. I think the next more used one was probably Ray Station, which I'm also familiar with. I'm happy to also walk you through how to use it. But since most of you are using Eclipse, that's what I'm going to attempt to use today to, to show you how I develop those volumes. And I'm going to make points that hopefully come across. The first two questions brought one, I would say the main one that I think we need to, to keep in mind is those pre lymph nodes are a common site of recurrence in rectal cancer. So careful delineation and revision is required. So I'm going to give you examples of that and I'm going to try to cover that. And, and same for the volumes for inguinal femoral nodes is not the seven millimeter expansion around vessels that is enough. Often it's more than one, one and a half, sometimes up to two centimeters to be able to include the lymph nodes at that region. That, that's the inguinal femoral lymph nodes. And another point that I'm going to make is in advanced cervical cancer that has distal vaginal involvement that warrants inguinal femoral nodes similar to that what we do for anal cancers. And similar for low lining distal rectal cancer, if they do involve the anus, the anal canal, that needs to include the inguinal lymph nodes. And yeah, that I shared the updated contouring guidelines, I emphasize anatomical blood vessel anatomy more than the traditional bony landmarks, which are useful. I still use them, but I think we are gaining more attention into following those blood vessels, knowing where they enter and exit different compartments of the body to be able to label those lymphatic regions accordingly. Oh, Dr. Castaneda, we have a question. On the note of sacral, the sacral nerve root region, one of our attendees, Vito, asks, is the sacral nerve root region included in other pelvic node contouring besides rectal cancer? I think the rectal is probably the most important. We pay a lot of attention as well, even, even to basically 
basically S5 for anal canal. So lower GI malignancies, we are very, very, very careful in how we delineate those pre-sectal lymph nodes. To some extent, gynecological malignancies, depending if they are T4 and they have invaded rectum, then it becomes important because they can drain into the pre-sectal lymph nodes as well, and they have a direct drainage to the pre -circle. So I would say it's not as important for prostate cancer and some early stage cervical cancers, but for lower GI, it becomes paramount importance to do appropriate coverage of those. All right, so here I have the case in pronoun in patient, I believe this was cervix 2, the cervix stage 2B, and I transferred those images into my Eclipse in the clinic, and we have it here. I select it because it's going to make my life much easier to follow blood vessels, and I do know that in many clinics, including many that I have worked, we didn't have the luxury of having IV contrast for all the cases that we wanted, and in needed coordination with diagnostic radiology, and it could be challenging. And in some hospitals, it's just not available, period. And that makes that not a possibility for planning of our patients. But in this case, we did have it. And not only that, but it has PO contrast, which helps a lot in knowing exactly which is a small bowel or large bowel and allows to counter those organs at risk much more easily. So I'm going to basically walk you through this particular treatment planning system. I like to get an idea where the anatomy is located by using this topogram view. So I see my kidneys that are enhancing because of the IV contrast, and I see those blood vessels beautifully enhancing and allowing me to, to create those contours much more easily. I do also see in the small bowel PO contrast, and as I follow that into the pelvis, I continue to see PO contrast and I start losing those blood vessels as they exit the pelvis into the inguinal canal, right there, crossing right there. I was walking you through the anatomy of the patient. So I see those kidneys enhancing because of the IV contrast. I see blood vessels, the aorta bifurcating into common iliacs and the common iliac veins here, common iliac arteries, and as they bifurcate into external iliacs and internal iliacs, both arteries and veins, those are the vessels that we're going to be following and contouring for pelvic lymph node radiation in the upper portion. And as we go inside the pelvis and we start seeing all the sacral, pre-sacral space, that also becomes the areas of contouring for many of the pelvic sites. And I was pointing that we have the PO contrast, which is very useful to distinguish small bowel and large bowel. All right. If I come to view, I can select the topogram view. I can select the more common three view of the sagittal coronal axial. We count it in axial for the most part in most treatment planning systems. Maybe not for a few other platforms, but in here, I like to, to start following those vessels as they bifurcate into internal and external iliac. And pay attention to that S5, L1 junction, and L4, L5, and how that correlates with, with the volumes that we're, we are trying to in, include. So remember this is stage two cervical cancer, and we can start, I have these volumes that are empty that I'm gonna start creating. And when I do the brush, I do the 1.4 centimeters. I'm sorry, I do the 0 0.7 centimeters. And instead of putting the center of the, of the contour, the edge of the vessel, what I do is I put my contour at the edge of the vessel, and that allows me to know what is the edge on one end of the vessel, and I know it's going to have seven millimeters around, and when I'm going over the bone, 
I made sure that not to include any of the vowel that is at that level. So right now I'm basically skipping all vowel and giving seven millimeters around those blood vessels, the common iliac veins and arteries. And that's probably not pathological looking lymph nodes. So that's important to include in the volume. We crop out of muscle and we continue going around the vessel without including bone. So this looks appropriate and note that I didn't put any of my volume inside the, the small bowel. So a small bowel is a good idea, as it was mentioned in the first session, to do our normal structures, contours before we do the targets. It's probably good practice. And in here, it's very, very important. Large bowel, not so much. But in a small bowel, being able to contour all those loops of bowel allowed me to know that I, I should not be going over that structure. So I turned that structure on. And, and to give you an idea, how would contour at that particular level this volume? You can notice that we have creating some donut holes in there. I don't pay attention to them. I don't clean them manually because that's time consuming. I leave them alone. And what I do at the end, and I contour, if I'm too busy in the clinic, I need to, to get through a few different patients in a specific amount of time. I contour every other slice and, and, and go without including the bowel. And we can even do something here. We can do avoid. And the bones are, are contouring some institutions, especially if they're going to do IMRT to, to try to document or to reduce the dose to the bone marrow, which is a good practice. It's probably one of the lower priorities in, in planning, in the IMRT planning. But in my case, since I have the bowel contour already, what I'm going to do is a small bowel avoid. And by doing so, I only pay attention to not going over the bone. And even I try to go and include some of that small bulb, I cannot. So I'm paying attention only to bone, the, the sacral vertebral body, and those blood vessels that I like to include. So as you see, I'm going to the edge of the vessel. And I could be going inside the bulb, but I have my avoid paint over in this part preventing me from going over bowel. And this saves a little bit of editing and saves a little bit of time. So if you have contour the bones, the pelvic bones, you can do that as they avoid a structure, but more often we contour either bowel back, which is very common practice. And that's a completely different topic and a completely different structure to pay attention how to contour well. And there are some guidelines and some expert opinions about it. But for the specific interest of this lecture or this space, this session, I'm not going over bowel. And that's enough for this contour. So this volume is not complete because I start going over here. Now I complete it without going over muscle because that's an anatomical barrier. But I do go to include, I was more generous, like one millimeter there, but that's okay. And then not include bone. So I try to hug the bone, hug the vertebral body at that sacred space without going in, in, in the inter, in, in between the vertebral body is a space. So you don't really need to contour that area. That's not a risk, but you do contour the anterior edge of the vertebral bodies at the level that you want to include. So that looks appropriate to me. If I could, I'd probably make this more even just to to make it easier for my interpolations to look right. And, and that would be probably an, an acceptable uh, a slice to contour at that particular level. So, and as we come down, and I, I did not go into too much detail, where will be my superior extent, but that's a very important question. For cervical cancer, we would like to start basically at the, which appropriately is what it was done in this particular case. I think that was the superior the superior edge right there and the bifurcation right there so going back to contouring for the structures small bowel we can follow those vessels at this level going more into probably that's s2 yeah s2 s3 level 
if I follow those vessels, I do the same, not to overlap, not to go over bowel, to include the sacral space without including the nerve roots. So we actually had a couple of questions about contouring nodal volumes while avoiding bowel. How does, it essentially sums up to you, how does one avoid, deal with the uncertainty due to bowel movement and in terms of avoiding bowel? And does the treatment delivery 3D versus IMRT affect our choices of contouring? It does. It does. So for 3D, you can have really spare bowel because often we do a pore field box and everything inside that box gets ready to basically full dose. And depending how homogeneous the plan is, it's slightly higher than full dose. So in, the, in that case, contours are still important to document those, sometimes because we have to consider radiation and, and because we need to know what organs receive what dose, especially the rectum and the bladder for the brachytherapy boost. So it's important to still do the contours and still even the whole pelvis gets treated. I do, I do still contour structures in, on, on CT. Being that said, we still go by anatomical bony landmarks to create those pelvic fields. And that will include basically all bowel. So the bowel uh, contouring, it doesn't become as important because it's not going to be driving uh, where doses deposit in the plant. For IMRT, it becomes of paramount importance because you want to give dosimetric, a dosimetric space around the target that's not including microscopic disease because right now I'm contouring CPDs. So the short answer to you is for 3D, we, I do still do contours, but everything gets those regardless of the contour. For MRT, it's of paramount importance because that's how we are able to lower GI toxicities and how we've been able to, to show and, 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 and prove that we decrease toxicities for MRT, in, specifically in anal cancer. In cervical cancer, more events, the ones that are have pathological lymph node involvement, and we like to boost those, IMRT becomes important because we can do simultaneous integrated boost and spare bowel and get to doses that bowel can tolerate. And in and, and, and those cases, not contouring over bowel. So you see, I, I can even can do that. But if I turn this off and I try to give the seven millimeters around the vessel, guess what? I'm going over bowel, which is microscopic, it cannot be. And part of your question is very important is, how do we account, I'm gonna control Z, so I can go back to that particular body. How can we account for changes day to day? And that's a very practical and important question. And that's why many institutions have transitioned to do bowel space, because it's more realistic where bowel can be on a given day is gonna vary. But if the ball space should be that virtual space in which at any point throughout the course of treatment, the bowel loops can take place. So, and that's, that's an important consideration to counter bowel back and limit going with our CTV expansions into bowel back. I will not sacrifice coverage if I had to still cover presacrals in a lower GI case, if I have to go over bladders, I show you in the example question, or if I have to go over even a little bit of the bone. So I, for those cases, I don't mind to go one millimeter, sometimes even two, into a sacrum hollow, into a sacral cortex, just to make sure that when I do my PTV expansions, it's gonna encounter that. Not as important for this particular cervical case, but, but it is important for her. And now I'm doing my shift and left click to delete. And probably you guys know that most of you use Eclipse. So I'm kind of reviewing the content. So I hope that summarizes the questions. They, they're practical and I don't think there is a single best answer to those. So I hope I was able to shine some light into how I see the difference between 3D planning and 3D contouring when we compare it to IMRT planning and IMRT contouring, which for the most part is, is very similar. It's just, we don't have control over where doses deposit on, on 3D plans, not, not fully anyways. 
So what I was telling you that you contour every couple of slices. So in here, they kind of have this function in some of the newer versions of Eclipse. If you don't have it, it's not a big deal. That kind of shows you where the next slide will probably be based on what you have contoured. And that allows you to have a sense if you do the interpolation, if it's gonna lie in a way that is appropriate. In this case, interpolation is not gonna be very helpful or very accurate. And I, I leave these areas with those donut holes. And at the end, when I do like every other slides, contours, I just do it a little bit faster. You have those external iliacs, internal iliacs, and that's the nerve root. And I see that a small lymph node, not so small, but round. I'll probably include that and just come all the way to the muscle, the edge of the bone, and include all, all that. And we are right now probably S2, S3. So I'm getting ready probably to come off from the sacral volume. And now I here see again my vessels and some of these lymph nodes. I was a little bit more generous than the seven millimeters that I told you. And that's okay if I'm not going over bowel, uh, bone, or muscle. And I tend to do like maybe two centimeters in the sacral, pre-sacral space. It's a nerve root, so I don't need to include that completely. I can do shift and delete to kind of abolish that contour. And what is important here, that was one of the questions, is you do want to have microscopic extent of your CTV beyond the vessel. Stopping there is leaving an area that can have microscopic involvement with lymph nodes in that region. So that's why we do the seven millimeters. And then the CTV to PTV expansion, depending on technology that you use, depending on the physics assessment of the devices that, that, that you guys have in your clinics. But often for daily image guided radiotherapy, as low as five to seven millimeters to the pelvis is probably enough for from CTV to PTV expansion. But we're gonna pay more attention in this particular uh, curriculum to the CTV creations and contouring for the most part, especially today because it's elective notes. So I would probably give to this particular plan if I do daily convince CT or daily KV, KV uh, with good bone alignment, I can probably do five millimeter expansion from this CTV. That's, that's kind of the point I wanted to make. So if I do interpolate those two contours, which probably you guys are very familiar with interpolation. So it's this particular icon and I interpolated those two. I'm gonna turn this off because it's looking too busy. And that did not do the trick because it's leaving me that open. So that needs to be revised. There are too much changes between those two slices. So basically in this case, a slide by slice is gonna be needed for, for the rest. And those donut holes, donut holes, you can come here for uh, post-processing, select to the all and fill all cavities. And you apply and those are done. So you don't have to delete them manually. That was one of the one of the uses of, of the TPS. So if you have it, you can use that particular. So let's see how different is this from the contour that it was actually this patient lined off. So it was more generous here, which I don't disagree. And as I said, one to two centimeters in the preceptor space is probably okay. And in here, I think they were too shy and maybe I was too generous, but this area deserves to pay attention when we cover. It's not at the a nerve root, but it is actually in the preceptor space. But for the most part, these are these are concordant. As I said, I saw that small lymph node there, so I was more generous. Nothing wrong with the staying at seven millimeters from there. But if you if you these are blood vessels, and as they are coming here, I think that's not keeping the seven millimeters. So this volume, I would revise it to include that area. All right, so this is when we do the internal and external iliacs, that's how we follow them. And as you see, in this case, it went over the bowel. So that's something that I, I will have to edit manually if that was my case, or if that was presented in, in contour rounds to mention to my colleagues. And uh, yeah, maybe they needed to crop out from, from bowel.
And it's not uncommon to have one millimeter overlap and that's easy to fix by just coming to the pelvic lift nodes. And if I do it here, if I want it to be more generous on those couple of slices that I created, and let's say I went without the void structure and I went into too much into my bowel, one way to fix it is a crop structure. So you want to crop the CTV, CTV lift nodes, and remove a part extended inside. And I'm going to do a small bowel. And I'm going to keep it at zero centimeters. And as you saw, I'm going to do control Z. Are you able to see my, my cursor? or that's not being displayed? Yes, we can see your cursor. Yep. Okay. So as you saw, that's a way to, instead of manually crop that, that structure from bowel, if you have the bowel contours array, that's what we advise to do the normal structures first, you can easily crop in from the rest of the volumes that area. So that volume could be relatively easily fixed that way. So we'll come here, that's pelvic lift nodes, we come here to crop structure, pelvic lymph nodes, CTV, and into a small bowel, and we crop it from, from bowel. To see, I create a volume, basically not including the bowel overlap, which is the appropriate way of contouring this. Where it becomes a little bit more decision, clinical call, is when we have, sometimes we have very distended bladders. This was probably the empty bladder scan. I believe this is to recreate an ITV for cervical movement or a better set for uterine movement. So we want to have a scan that is empty bladder like this. And we want to have a scan that has a, bull, a full bladder. And, and basically that accounts for the motion and that's that allows to create our ITVs for cervical cases. But my point here is when these bladders are too full, they come in proximity to if this would have been a bladder, bowel would be pushed out of the pelvis into the abdomen and it easily can come into the obturator region. And in that case, it's not wrong to allow to go a few millimeters inside of the, of the bladder, even at the obturator. And, and that's the practice that I, I, I do use and I have seen many of my mentors using it. So it's not going by the book that you have to come every single time in every single scenario in every single patient of the bowel. I say that's okay practice, but when it comes to bladder, if the bladder is limiting the extent of obturator coverage and it's making it this look, as, let's think this has a over the bladder and the volumes of seven millimeters and they're looking something more like this because you have a very distended bladder. My point is, it's not wrong to still have a good seven millimeter around that obturator vessel. See, that's seven millimeters, despite going inside the bladder. That's okay. The bladder can take the dose. We often use 45 to 50.4 gray or elective lip nodes, and bladder can definitely take that dose, and it's appropriate to, to leave the volume with the seven millimeter expansion around the obturator vessels okay this is uh, yes oh so we have a question about the essentially the borders of the contour so valerie is asking do you contour to s3 even if you already see the piriformis muscle no no piriformis muscle should be the anatomical landmark to to stop the contour so that's uh, the consensus and the guidelines for the lower edge of the elective nodal volume so yeah, you don't have to cover necessarily S3 because the anatomical landmarks that follow vessels are preferred currently over just bony landmarks. Bony landmarks were very useful when we only had 3D and we or even clinical setups or just films. But now that we have 3D reconstructions and CTs, I think we have transitioned for the most part to anatomical landmarks that correlate with blood vessel entering and exiting canals and, and areas of involvement, because that's a area that is going to have a natural barrier for extension of disease beyond that point. That's what we unfollow the obturators when they live. 
the, the pelvis. We don't follow that anymore because they are not a risk for involvement in cervical cancer or, or basically in, in, in none of those pelvic sites that we treat in radiation oncology. All right, that's a good question. That is a very good question. So any questions about this volume? So I'm gonna review because I thought it was appropriate. I thought it was clinically usable for the most part. I'm just being picky here that it, it didn't crop out of the bowel, which is something that is gonna decrease toxicity to bowel without sacrificing good coverage. And in here, they did follow the blood vessels, the external iliacs. They were a little bit shy here, you see? I like to see my seven millimeters around that blood vessel completely, as opposed to too tight. That's like three millimeters. So I like to see that seven millimeter there. But what I, the point I was making is we're already at the femoral head. So traditionally, that will be one landmark to stop contouring. And I think here we start seeing it, and that's where they stop, but they keep going probably one more slice. But in this side, in the right side, despite having the femoral head, the external iliacs were included, which I do think is appropriate. It's a little bit more tricky for the physicists and the dosimetrists to, to give us that not very, it, it just needs to account for, for, the, for the anatomical limits of the volume. So yeah, either manually crop it out or as I show you with the crop structure and bringing that off outside the, the small bulb. And yeah, basically here you see the inguinal canal. So that's probably a good, a good way of looking at this. So I'm, I'm doing now the scroll button. If I press it, I can move this up. And if I do control, and and, then, and the scroll up and down, I can do zoom in and zoom out without having to, to come to the other functions that you see here. So it's a good way for me to realigning things in a way that is useful to, to see. Same here, if I wanna pay attention to that in one canal, maybe I can bring this cross herrings into the area that is gonna tell me, oh yeah, we're exiting as the inguinal canal. And it's quite nice. We stop following them when it crosses the inguinal canal. So pretty good edge of that volume for the femoral, the external, I'm sorry, for the external iliac contours. So that's one. Once you are entering the inguinal canal, basically stop for external iliacs. For inguinal femoral contours, I don't think I... Maybe the anal case, maybe we can, any questions so far about superior edge for cervical cancer coverage when you have the bifurcation, basically is what we start seeing that happened there. We start following the bifurcation of the common iliacs and through external internal iliacs. And that's when we start a counter and cropping our bowel, having the seven millimeters everywhere, except when it goes into bowel including here, this large bowel, I will also crop out from that. So that's the descending column becoming the sigmoid. And what is my large bowel? So there was a question about the landmark of the inferior bound of the external iliac um, is asking if you use the deep circumflex artery branch as the landmark for the inferior border of the external iliac. If I can find it, and if I doubt, I can always ask my colleagues from radiology. That's an acceptable landmark. Sometimes it's difficult to really say it, especially if you don't have IV contrast. But yes, see, we're exiting now. When it's branching out and exiting the pelvis, obviously you don't have to continue tracking it and including the volume. So that volume could have been cropped out basically beyond that, that area. That could be cropped out and only stay with the obturators, including the in, in that particular level. Okay. And oh. another question we have is if we have a mesorectal node involved due to rectal invasion from cervical cancer primary, do you like to include the entire mesorectum in your coverage or just the involved node? I'm gonna I, I I'm tempted to prefer that answer because that's more for the contouring of the primary site or when 
the extension of the cervical cancer or the gynecological cancer goes into a, a, a structure that, that, that would require the mesorectum coverage. So mesorectum is absolutely the correct answer. You think a rectum is involved, even if it's from extension from a T4 cervical cancer, I do think that the mesorectum should be included. So, so yes, but that's not typically an elective volume for, for, for lip nodes. Uh, the, the mesorectum, it is, it is elective for a rectal case, not for a T4 cervical case. Is that where the question was contained or, or I'm missing? Yep, I, I think that you got it. Yeah, basically we try to cover the mesorectum, right? And with that instance, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that, would, that would become an appropriate elective volume, yes. Yep, Absolutely okay. Appropriate. So All going... Right. This anal case, I think we have, in my opinion, too tight. So yeah, you're seeing here the anal canal being covered and the anal marker, at the anal birch, you put a BB it. That's very appropriate, because sometimes it's hard to know on CT what is the anal birch. So putting BB it's there is absolutely appropriate and important and helpful. Looks like they have a cylinder inside the vagina that helps us to know what is the vaginal extent and probably counter that. But more importantly, I like to now to jump into an anal case in which we electively need to cover the inguinal femoral leaf nodes. And my points here have to do with being very generous. We have seen recurrences as far as two centimeters from the vessels. So this eight, I'm sorry, this seven millimeter expansion around the vessels is insufficient. You don't have to go over the, the sartorial muscle here. That's not an area of, I'm gonna make this bigger. I'm gonna come here and I am, this is an area that I'm not concerned. So if I need to start cropping out from, from muscle, that would be, appropriate. However, this contrast it is, I noted that it's following the vessels, but you see a small lymph nodes are completely missed by that volume. Is that a pathological lymph node? Probably not by size criteria, but could it be harboring microscopic disease from an anal cancer of cell carcinoma? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's why the seven millimeter expansion around the vessels is insufficient to cover that. And the more appropriate is probably the one to one and a half centimeters. So if I do one and a half centimeters around that vessel, you see that automatically I'm including those small lymph nodes. So we are more generous in this particular location, the inguinal femoral region to anteriorly and medially, because those areas are of high risk of recurrence. So we are too tight on our IMRT fields. Sure, we do have less toxicity in the montis pubis and, and we have less toxicity on the skin and patients tolerate that better, but we're not doing a good service to them because if they have a recurrence, now they need to get lymphadenectomy that can be morbid and, and, and then we are missing an opportunity to in, increase in local control and sometimes even, even progress on free survival. So you see that particular volume and I think, I believe this was an educational case. I don't believe this was a clinical case, but in here we are being too generous at the muscle edge. That's not a risk of microscopical involvement, but if we are only using the seven millimeter, which is at the edge right there from the middle of the, of the circle, that's probably seven millimeters. So it's basically only covering one centimeter or when I do 1.5 centimeters, I include that. So it's not just matter to have an uniform two centimeters or 1.5 centimeters. It's also being mindful that at the very minimum, I will do probably one to one and a half, but, but more importantly is looking at the patient anatomy is gonna inform us also to be generous anteriorly and medially. And now the volumes are basically jumping in and out. So a sartorius is not necessarily, it doesn't need complete to be included. You can include some of that, that's okay. But more importantly is, and the, 
is definitely being generous and tyranny immediately. That's a key and a, a common mistake as we're getting familiar with IMRT, which because I do believe is less toxic and we have phase two data to prove that in randomized and uh, randomized trial to prove improvement in, in toxicities when we use IMRT for anal cancer. But then if you go to ATLAS, the RTO ATLAS, you'll see that they have a very generous area here, which I think I can possibly show that if we go to e and we select one of the anal cases there. So are you guys right now looking at my e website? And that was N1. So this T2, N1, N0, it's chromosome carcinoma of the anus. So you see that they are definitely not expanding the volume, just the typical seven millimeters, but this is jumping too quickly. I apologize for that. And the IV contrast was very helpful in, in delineating this case. They're not including the muscle, but they are very, very generous anteriorly and medially. So, and they crop out the, the PTV from a skin, which is appropriate for the skin sparing without sacrifice, unless the lip node has a skin involvement, which is not that common, but sometimes in very advanced cases we do see. So that's, I would say, common mistake number two. We talked about it. And that lip node that I saw, you see it has a fatty high lung, is not too pathologically uh, concerning and is common up to 20 to 30 percent of the inguinal leaf nodes could be just reactive and in in many of our cases or even in, in patients that have no GI malignancies so it's a common area of having leaf nodes that are just reactive so that one looks pretty not too suspicious for malignancy I see a body high lung not necessarily round it's more oval in shape but nevertheless it's I would say that it's more than two centimeters away from the blood vessel. And yet it was included appropriately. Okay, so that was the point that I wanted to make related to the inguinofemoral region. Any questions so far about topical uh, to anal? So yeah, we have a few questions. I'll start off with the questions about Anal, since we are, since we just worked through that case. So one question we have from Dr. Sui is for contouring the femoral node, how much for how much anterior margin do we need to contour that given that most macroscopic disease is at the anterior medial or the medial margin? I would say at least 1.5 centimeters, but I have seen many experienced GI radiation oncologists that go all the way to two centimeters. You don't have to come out of the skin, obviously, and you can still be within five millimeters from the skin, but being generous anteriorly, medially is absolutely appropriate for this volume. So the 0.7 centimeters or the seven millimeters is not appropriate everywhere. And this is the prime example of that. So yes. I did a 1.5 and I thought that was reasonable for this case. I don't see a lot of large bulky lymph nodes and this was not reported as having M positive disease as far as I was able to tell from, from the pronoun part of the case, which we can definitely review. Okay. So um, this is in our case. Yes, go ahead. Oh, right. And we have some other yes, questions. Okay. So. How about coverage of the mesorectum for involvement of the anus? Correct. So, well, yeah. So it sorry, go to, ahead. Yeah. It needs to be included because of the mucosal extent from the anal canal into the distal rectum and subsequent drainage into the primary drainage of the rectum. And that is the mesorectum. So yes, so as you see in this particular volumes, that's the anal birch mark. And they have pretty generous mesorectum coverage. Okay. So Great. thank you. Maybe too generous here. If you want to be super cute and anatomically constrained, maybe you can spare one millimeter there, but it's appropriate to go 
all the way to the to the sacrum, basically all the way to S5. That's very appropriate in our case. So this counter is appropriate at that particular level. They go even on top of the, of the S5, they include it in the CP, which I think is fine. Because in this area, we want to be more generous than tight to cover, and the mesorectum is included as part of the elective body for anal case, yes. Okay, thank you. And another question we have from Mary Louise is, what is your landmark for the inferior extent for inguinal node elective coverage? So the bony landmark traditionally was the trochanter, and I think that's where they stopped in this particular volume, and I thought that that was probably fine. So you see trochanter is gone, and they stopped following. So that's, but it's basically once you have the bifurcation of the femorals, that's where you probably can stop. This one doesn't have a big contrast, so femoral vessels start bifurcating around there. I probably should have the course of more. So you see here as they bifurcating and leaving the inguinal canal, we can probably stop the contour around there. So this was, I want to say that it was more based in body and landmark, which I still use. I, I try to follow vessels and compartments that are going to constrain and, and come natural barriers for spread. But there is nothing wrong to still keep an eye on, on those bony landmarks. And if they coincide, great. If they don't coincide, just use clinical judgment. If you're going to just give a few more a millimeters, one or two slices, and you're seeing, like I'm saying, those small leaf nodes right in the vicinity, probably being more generous is not going to be a harm the patient and it's not going to provide too much more toxicity at that level. So when in doubt, I would probably include my gene, my clinical judgment to, to aid that. And sometimes I've seen bifurcations of blood vessels without IV contrast. It's, it can be challenging. That's what we relied on a lot of anatomical bony landmarks in the past. I hope that tends to answer that question. I think it certainly does. We do have a clarification question regarding coverage of the mesorectal space. So from what I understand, we cover the entire mesorectal space in our CTV. Is that correct? And, and this is from Ben. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. And I know that we have a, a few more questions for now. I'm going to hold them and we'll try to get to them in a few minutes or at the end. So yeah, thank you. No problem. If they're related to these contours, maybe we should just jump into them because I can go back to either an eclipse or pronoun and, and, and try to, to be more visual to answer them. If they're more theoretical in nature, maybe we can leave it to the end. I'll, I'll, I'll let you make the decision. I think for now, well, there is one question that is potentially relevant with the prostate case. It's broadly relevant to so the question is, when do we use bowel loop versus bowel bag? Bowel bag, I think, is the easier clinically, and, and you're being more conservative because that's a bigger volume where potentially the bowel can be. Contouring bowel loops individually can be tedious, time-consuming, and, and not necessarily correlate always with clinical outcomes. So if you have the time, the patience, and the manpower to do loops, you can use metrics for them and be very tight. They become very important in advanced technologies such as MR Linux. Uh, we can even do adaptive planning for, for accounting where the duodenum is in, in relationship with the pancreas. And that will become very important to look at the bowel loop contour on a daily basis before every treatment. But more generally speaking, for these pelvic cases, when we think about 3D and IMRT, I think it's absolutely appropriate to to just use the bowel back. And I did have a paper that I can, I didn't send initially, but now that we're talking about bowel loops and bowel back, I think it's, 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 it's probably pretty relevant. So if you look at the expert contour of bowel back, they go all the way to the edge of the vessel and all the way to the edge of the psoas and all the way to the edge of the virtual bodies. And I rarely see that bowel, uh, bowel back contour in any of my clinical cases for 
in the institutions that I have worked and, and when you go to countering courses. So it's one thing what experts do think we should be countering is ball back and it, it is slightly different, the adaptation to more clinical relevant ball back. So I don't think I gave you a very precise answer to that, but I give you a flavor that is probably a, a moving target. And, but it is important to have that standardized at the particular institution where you guys work, meaning being just consistent. Our ball bag is going to go all the way to the blood vessels, but it's going to allow enough space for, for the CTVs and the PTVs of the pelvic lymph nodes to, to account and be treated. So that's, that, that would be my, my long answer to that. But I, I think I'm going to just email you guys. The, it's a relatively... I think it was in Practice of Radiation College, one of the Astro journals in which I, I thought it was practical and I thought it was it was provocative. I haven't seen it in many, many places, but I think at least that discussion should have internally to make things consistent within your own departments. And not to, because you're already 920, at least for me, I know you guys in different time zone, but keep this within the one and a half hours that we promise you, or at least uh, we're aiming to. I leave you with the prosy cases. I believe the volume of, of cases, depending on where you guys are located in different countries in Asia, is different. But definitely cervical cancer is among the, the most prevalent. But second to that probably will be the GI malignancies and, and, and close to that, the, the prostate cancers. So this is very appropriate reading. And... All of this has to do with more with the primary and how we can use different landmarks to, to create those volumes. But I'd like to kind of bring your attention to here. So these are a significant group of experts. The harder you see the color, the more agreement between expert contours there was. And you see how it's not lighting very warm colors at the external iliac contour for a prostate case, meaning that some experts do include that, like I show you cases in the gynecological realm and in the lower GI realm. So in prostate cancer, some experts do include it very similarly because that's appropriate before it goes into the inguinal canal, but some other experts do not. So that to give you a sense, and obviously you can quickly uh, estimate that. And this area is, is for your own your review. I think these contours are beautiful. They're well basically accounted and, and it, it kind of walks you through all the different vascular landmarks that you need to be paying attention to and, and how to, to account for appropriate presacral contours in prostate cases. So as you see, they're not really going inside. Are you able to see my cursor now? Can you, yep. Okay, very good. So yeah, to, not, to, to make note of that, GI cases basically go all the way to, to the nerve roots, exiting, but in, in the OC cases, not so much. And, and you see, they are more generous here anteriorly. I suppose the, the seven millimeters that we have been talking for most of the pelvic lymph node contours, they're saying, hey, do one centimeter. And it has to do with multiple series, many of them retrospective showing patterns of failure. So it's informing appropriately evidence-based uh, contouring guidelines. And beautiful obturator, very tight uh, contours at the obturator region, obturator chain, and where to stop following the obturators. Once they ex exit the, the pelvis, you stop the contour. And sometimes it's much easier to see that on the coronals or the 3D rendering. And if you have MRI, you can definitely use it to inform those blood vessel spaces and, and the loops and the, and the bladder that are very next to, which is much better definition than what I, in this T2 image, than what you get on, on a CT scan, even with every contrast. And some useful constraints that, that it might be, I mean, it's handy to have in the clinic. All right, I think I did cover most of my ambitious plan. And as I said, this is just an introductory conversation to, to be had and, and more to come in, in the site specific contouring sessions. Mm -hmm.